When Baker and Zubrin presented Mars Direct to their bosses at Martin, they expected the worst. To their surprise, the management was excited about it. They liked the fact that everything needed was relatively simple. As time went on, Martin Marietta embraced Mars Direct as their creation and put Bob and I on an airplane to several NASA centers to present Mars Direct and try to build some momentum for it. Baker and Zubrin flew to one of the most conservative NASA groups, Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. This had been one of the original design hubs for the Apollo moon landings, but recently many of the engineers had become demoralized by the failure of NASA's Mars program. Together, Baker and Zubrin presented their alternative mission architecture. The response was thrilling. The old-school Apollo crowd embraced it. This was a plan that actually made sense and was within reach. Over the next few weeks, Zubrin and Baker were flown around the country, pitching to all branches of NASA, and everywhere they went, the response was electric. The plan was standing up to scrutiny, and groups all over NASA were converting to Mars Direct. Their tour culminated in a public presentation to the National Space Society. The crowd gave the two aerospace engineers a standing ovation. A week later, the American press picked up the story. But a counterattack was beginning to form within NASA. The space station teams and many in the advanced propulsion groups were against the idea. Since Mars Direct didn't need their programs, they felt under threat. As quickly as doors opened for Zubrin and Baker, they began to close. The race to launch a manned mission to Mars has pitted the might of NASA against two solitary scientists. As NASA grappled with a complex and highly expensive program, David Baker and Robert Zubrin blew the scientific community apart by coming up with a strikingly simple plan called Mars Direct. It was greeted with adulation, but no sooner had the applause died down the NASA fought back. NASA didn't want to pursue a Mars mission at that time. They didn't want to be derailed by a bunch of Mars fanatics that thought that their idea of what NASA should do should overwhelm what NASA thought NASA should do. Fearful that their own research would be rendered useless, NASA rejected Mars Direct. The two engineers were outsiders again, but Zubrin remained determined. Bob had grabbed hold of it, and I could see that it was his, and no matter what I did, he was going to do what he was going to do, and he was going to be a proponent for it and push it, and I really saw my role sort of evaporate. It's a little bit like being a, a dim planet next to a bright star around him in terms of his enthusiasm, and you really can't compete with that. All you can do is decide how you're going to deal with it. By February 1991, Baker had quit Martin Marietta Astronautics to start his own firm. Zubrin battled on. For the next year and a half, Zubrin tried to get NASA to pay attention, giving speeches, writing papers. But Mars Direct's time seemed to have passed. But then a new administration came into power at NASA. They challenged Zubrin to prove rocket fuel could be produced on Mars. And he did. Dan Golden, the new administrator at NASA, got Zubrin to give detailed briefings to the engineers at the Johnson Space Center. They liked it, but had some reservations. There were a number of things that we were concerned about with Bob Zubrin's mission. Uh, first of all, we thought his estimates of mass were, were probably too optimistic. Uh, didn't have sufficient margins for a variety of things, not the least of which would be things like provisions for the crew, the amount of water that would be required. We thought his ascent vehicle was very large, which meant his power requirements, his propellant requirements were much larger than needed to be. Weaver took Zubrin into his office and the two men worked out a compromise plan. First, Weaver wanted three launches for every mission instead of two. In the first year, three ships would launch, an MAV, a Mars Ascent Vehicle, an unoccupied HAB with extra supplies, 
and an ERV, an Earth Return Vehicle. The HAB and MAV would land on the surface and begin producing fuel for the return flight and air for the crew. These craft would spend two solitary years on Mars, allowing NASA to test all of the systems before sending a human crew. Then in the third year, three more ships would launch, this time with the HAB occupied by astronauts. The other two ships were for a future mission, unless needed for a backup for the present crew. Once on Mars, the team could also utilize the first HAB. Then after a year and a half stay, the crew would climb aboard their small capsule, blast off, and rendezvous with the return ship. This ship would carry them back home in a roomier environment than Zubrin's ERV. Zubrin called the plan Mars Semi-Direct. NASA called it the Design Reference Mission. The plan was subjected to the same cost analysis as NASA's original Mars project with its $450 billion price tag. The design reference mission came back at a fraction of the cost, $55 billion. Spread out over 10 years, it could be done within NASA's existing budget. The plan made the cover of Newsweek. Here was a mission that was affordable and could be carried out with today's technology. But NASA's astronauts have not left low Earth orbits since.